I would like to welcome all the participants and panelists to the last uh, to the last webinar of the Big Green Festival entitled The Global Water Crisis. We will be addressing water pollution, uh, forever chemicals, and the case of Zain Gabangbola. I would like before uh, before uh, um, presenting the panelists, I would like to um, start with a quote from the 2021 report of the UN Special Rapporteur on the issue of human rights obligations relating to the enjoyment of a safe, clean, healthy and sustainable environment, which was presented to the Human Rights Council. I will place the link in the chat. The report's entitled Human Rights and the Global Water Crisis, Water Pollution, Water Scarcity and Water Related Disasters. Water is the lifeblood of human beings and life on Earth. Humans are 70% water and our brains 85%. Many people, particularly indigenous peoples, consider water to be sacred. Although water covers most of the planet's surface, the amount of fresh water is surprisingly limited. Accessible fresh water represents less than 1% of the Earth's water. People depend on fresh water for drinking, cooking, cleaning, sanitation, growing food, fishing, generating energy, navigation, recreation and tourism. Safe, sufficient water and healthy aquatic ecosystem are essential for protecting health, achieving food security and ending poverty. Yet, even though water is absolutely vital to life and well-being, the human rights to safe in drinking water and sanitation remain under threat. We have an amazing panel here tonight, which I'm very honored to introduce. We've got Liana Hosea, an award-winning BBC journalist, whose um, documentary, Thirst for Justice, you've hopefully just watched. We have Mr. Robert Bellot, a US attorney and partner of Taft Law, a renowned law, law firm based in Cincinnati, in Northern Kentucky. We have Mr. Pedro Arrojo Agudo, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights to Safe Drinking Water and Sanitation. And we have Kai Gabangbola, Zane Stadi, a tireless campaigner for the Truth About Zane campaign. I will give longer introductions prior to the panelists speaking. So every panelist will st speak for about 10 minutes and then uh, each panelist can ask another panelist a question if they, they so wish. So I would like to start introducing Ms. Le Leana Hosea. She's an award-winning BBC journalist who's been in international news for 13 years and covered a lot of incredible stories. From filming and reporting on the Arab Spring from day one in Egypt's Tahrir Square to the war in Gaza, she made several BBC documentaries, including on rhino poaching in South Africa and extremism in Yemen. In 2016, Liana went to America on a prestigious Knight Wallace Journalism Fellowship and studied water contamination and environmental justice at the University of Michigan. She was so moved by the people she met, she stayed on to make her first independent documentary Thirst for Justice, which you've hopefully just seen. Making this film, she found herself amidst uh, piles of radioactive waste and even jail. She's now an in investigative TV journalist for BBC London. So I will hand over to Liana now. Hi everyone, and thank you so much for inviting me on this panel. I feel like um, <coughs> I've just had my say with an hour worth of my film actually. So I was hoping that, you know, maybe I could just, um, you know, take any comments or any questions that you might have about it. Um, because obviously I kind of looked at a few places in the US and um, from Flint, Michigan, and then down on the Navajo reservation in the Southwest. And obviously they're different contaminants and there's different histories there, but um, I connected them together through you know, issues of um, state corporate crime, uh, the, the cover up, um, communities of color, environmental injustice, and then how these communities kind of took agency and got their own scientists and did their own testing and, you know, kind of proved what had been, you know, suspected all along that uh, their water was indeed horribly, you know, dangerously um, dangerously contaminated, especially 
uh, when you're having to drink it every day. So it's the kind of the build up, the chronic exposure. Um, and so, yeah, I was just wondering if anybody had, uh, maybe Jan, you, you could kick off or. What I will do in that case, I will ask um, participants, especially those that have just watched your film, to post questions in the Q&A section. Mm -hmm. And I will, in the meantime, I will hand over to Mr. Robert Bilot um, to do his presentation. Um, so Mr. Robert Bilot is a US attorney and partner of Taft Law, a renowned law firm, firm based in Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky. He's an internationally recognized litigator, advocate, and author who has practiced in environ environmental law for more than 30 years. He has gained international prominence in connection with uncovering and disclosing the worldwide impact of environmental contamination by the so-called forever chemicals, known as PFAS, particularly PFOA and PFOS. In 2017, Rob received, received the International Right Livelihood Award, also known as the Alternative Nobel Prize, for his decades of work on PFAS for other chemicals. He's portrayed in the 2019 film Dark Waters. He started out as a lawyer defending chemical companies and ended up being described by the New York Times as, quote unquote, the lawyer who became DuPont's worst nightmare after, uh, after exposing the corporation for decades long history of chemical pollution. His book, Exposure, has just been published and is a fantastic read. So I'm handing over to Rob Bilot. Thank you, thanks so much. You know, it's really an honor for me to be on this panel today and, and particularly to be discussing this topic, you know, environmental contamination, particularly that of our, of our water. Uh, I hope all of you had a chance to watch the film. Uh, by Liana it was an excellent uh, depiction of what, what the real impact is on real people in real communities from dealing with the discovery of contamination in our drinking water. Uh, you know, in that film, you saw the impact in, in communities where there were known, recognized contaminants in the water, things like uranium or lead. You know, chemicals that we know about, we know the toxicity, yet are still out there and still posing these kinds of challenges for us. You know, over the last 22 years or so of my career, uh, as you heard from Jan, I'm a, uh, an, an attorney in the United States. Um, I kind of stumbled in to uncovering uh, contamination of a much more, <laughs> uh, something that's completely changed my view frankly, of, of the world of regulated toxic hazardous chemicals. You know, as, as you heard, I had spent the first part of my career really focusing on trying to help our, our clients, a lot of which were big companies, big corporate clients, a lot of big chemical companies, try to understand the, the, the complex federal and state laws that exist in the United States to control emissions of things out into the environment. And I thought I had a pretty good handle on all of that, that we had comprehensive federal laws, state laws that identified and listed toxic hazardous materials, the things that we needed to be concerned about. But we, there were levels that were set by the top scientists and regulators in the country telling us how much is too much of these particular chemicals. Not only things getting out into our water, but also into our air. How much was allowed to be put into landfills? And as long as we were following these rules and regulations and making sure that these identified toxins were not going out into our environment at too high of levels and were not getting into people's drinking water, that everything was okay. <laughs> Yet in 1998, I got a call in my office um, and a gentleman on the other end of the line started telling me uh, about cows dying on his property. Uh, in a small town in West Virginia along the Ohio River and that I needed to help him. After all, I was an environmental lawyer uh, and he had gotten my name from my grandmother. And this was because this was a town my mom's family had grown up. So I knew well. And what he started to explain to me was that he was watching his cows uh, that were grazing on his property where there was a creek running through the property. He could see white foam coming into that creek 
from a landfill next door owned by this massive company called DuPont, one of the world's largest chemical companies at the time. And he was convinced there was something in that white foaming water that was hurting the cows. They were developing tumors. Calves were being born stillborn uh, or, or dead. And the, the calves were, were and cows were developing blackened teeth. And it wasn't just the cows. Uh, it was the wildlife in the area, the deer, the fish, the birds. And by the time he had called me, he had lost over 100 animals on his farm from this. And he was convinced it's pretty obvious what's happening. There's something in this white foam coming out of this landfill. And this was a landfill regulated in, by the state of West Virginia. So it had permits that were specifying what was allowed, what was too high. What, so I thought this would be a fairly straightforward case. I could help him. I could pull the permits that were regulating that landfill, and we could quickly identify what was, what was happening. After all, if there was something toxic or dangerous, we would be able to identify it in those permits. That, that was not the case. Now, as we started digging into that case, what we under, uncovered was that there was a chemical in that landfill in massive quantities, thousands of tons of this chemical, and it was incredibly toxic, biopersistent, bioaccumulative, could cause cancer. There were decades of studies by the manufacturer of the chemical uh, showing all kinds of problems with it, even studies among workers in the factories that were exposed showing all kinds of problems. Yet this was completely unregulated. It wasn't on any of our lists of regulated toxic chemicals. So I started digging in to find out what was happening here. And we, had to, we ended up getting into litigation with DuPont over this. And as we dug into these files, what we discovered was these were completely man-made chemicals that had not existed on the planet prior to World War II, completely created by man invented primarily by the 3M company right after World War II. These were chemicals that had this unusual chemical structure of carbons attached to fluorine. Didn't exist in nature, that kind of chemical structure, but it made them incredibly useful in all kinds of manufacturing products. And so these chemicals had come out into the market right after the war. And this was, keep in mind, decades before the United States Environmental Protection Agency even came into existence. That didn't happen until 1970. A lot of the federal laws and regulations governing and restricting chemicals in the US didn't come out until the late 70s and 80s. So these chemicals were created and started to be used and put out into the world decades before those regulations even occurred. Um, and what we saw though, was even though this was before the regulators started looking at them, the companies had looked at these chemicals and had been concerned about this unique chemical structure because not only did it make it incredibly valuable, these, these chemicals known as PFOA or PFOS uh, that had eight carbons attached to fluorine were incredibly useful in making all kinds of products, stain resistant, waterproofing, clothing, carpeting, fast food wrappers, packaging, firefighting foams, nonstick cookware, you name it. So for decades, these things had been emitted and put out into the world, but the scientists had looked at that unique chemical structure and, and noticed they were incredibly valuable in manufacturing, but that chemical structure made, had some pretty unique impacts in the environment. It wouldn't break down when it was out in the environment. If it got out into the world, into the water, into the soil, it would stay there virtually forever. You're he you hear these chemicals referred to now as forever chemicals because of this. When they get out, they don't break down under natural conditions. Some of the company scientists tell us it could be thousands, if not millions of years for these chemicals to start breaking down. They will be here after humans are off the planet. So as these chemicals are going out and scientists realize they have this persistence in the, in the environment, they start doing animal studies and finding the toxicity of them. They could cause cancer, all these various problems. And they start seeing the fact that, gee, we're emitting these from our factories into the air, directly into rivers in the United States, directly into landfills. Yet, <laughs> despite all of this information about the toxicity, I was looking through these files that the company had and realizing none of this information though was, was outside of the company. And why was that? How could, some chem how could chemicals like this that were being used in such massive quantities for decades 
that had toxicity, bioperistence, bioaccumulation. And what we were seeing in these documents, not only could this stuff get out in the environment and stay there and, and get into our air and water, if it got into living things, they had the unique ability to get into the blood and stay there and circulate throughout our, our entire system. The tiniest amounts could build up over time. So as you're drinking it, even the most tiny amounts in your water could build up to higher and higher levels in your blood. You know, we're exposed to all kinds of chemicals. Our body has the incredible ability to excrete a lot of those and get rid of them. These chemicals, our body can't. They stay in there and they build up. So they're toxic, persistent, bioaccumulative. And the scientists internally in the companies were understanding that. They had found, in fact, in the 1970s that this chemical was getting into the blood all over the United States. But that information I was reading wasn't in the government files, wasn't out there in the scientific community. It was in the internal science company files. And I was trying to figure out how is it these aren't regulated? And what we found to understand, and I tried to explain this in my book, Exposure, how does something like this happen? How can something like this happen in the United States in modern times? And what we find is the regulatory system here, despite all the science, the laws that came into place essentially were focusing on new chemicals that came out as these laws came out in the late 70s and 80s. And for these existing chemicals, Essentially, the companies, it was left up to the companies to say, to alert the agencies if there was information suggesting a substantial risk to human health or the environment. And what was happening, despite information showing that substantial risk, companies withheld the data and just didn't disclose it. So despite all this information, the rest of the world didn't know about it. So as we as I've learned all of this and found out all of this information, we I finally alerted the US EPA in 2001, the community around this this facility found out. So we realized this was not just a contamination of cows in a creek. This chemical had made its way out from a nearby Teflon manufacturing plant that DuPont owned. That's where this waste was coming from that ended up in the landfill, the world's largest Teflon manufacturing facility had been emitting this into the air, into the Ohio River, into landfills for decades. Not only that, they had found it was contaminating the public water supply for tens of thousands of people around that plant. Their own scientists, even though it wasn't regulated, had come up with a safety level for drinking water, no more than 0.6 parts per billion, which you may wonder, what does that mean? That was the lowest, about the lowest level you could detect it back then. So the internal scientists are saying, if we could detect it in the water, we're concerned about it. Yet the levels they were finding in the community were five to 10 times higher than that. Nobody was being told. So when we provided this information to the agency, this was 2001. And as a spoiler alert in the United States, these chemicals are still not regulated in federal, as a federal drinking water requirement in the United States. This regulatory process is incredibly slow. So as we made this information available, the regulators finally started to dig in. They sued DuPont. They brought a, a case against them saying this information had been withheld. Community found out about this. And we brought a lawsuit to try to get them clean water and to try to get this information out. And those of you who have seen the film, Dark Waters, or the documentary, The Devil We Know, you see the story of what it took for this community, even though we knew the toxicity of the chemical, we knew that it was in the water, how long it took for that community to get the information out to the, to the rest of the world, to the scientists, to the regulators, to the public. This is a public health threat. And it's not just here in West Virginia. We now know this chemical because of its uses is now has been present in drinking water all over the world, all over the United States. It's being found all over all over the planet. Sampling, unfortunately, is just now beginning in many places, including in the UK. Despite the fact these chemicals are typically found in firefighting foam sprayed outside of airports, military bases. In Japan, they're finding massive contamination. In Australia, Italy, Germany. And so as what, what you see in the film is the incredible burdens and barriers that are in place for people who are exposed to chemicals like this in the environment to actually get something done about it because the burden 
on the, in the in the U.S. legal system is upon the exposed people. They're told if you find out you have a chemical exposure like this, it's your burden to come in and prove that it's causing you harm, that that chemical is harmful, that you've been made sick by it. And what you see in the, in the film Dark Waters is how difficult that was. That was one of the few times ever that communities were able to actually get big enough studies, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people to confirm those health effects. Yet the communities in our legal system are told it's their burden to show this is harming you. Meanwhile, man-made chemicals like this are in the blood of virtually every person on the planet. Chemicals that are now being associated with impaired immune function and possibly decreased vaccine response in the middle of a pandemic, yet they're in our drinking water, they're in our blood and they're passed on to our children. And nobody really has been talking about this. It's been going on for 70 years. And so I was incredibly fortunate to be able to team up with folks at Participant Media, folks like Mark Ruffalo, who were able to do the film Dark Waters and the documentary, The Devil We Know, and the book to get stories like this out so that people understand these, that this is the way it happens. Even in places like the United States, where we have allegedly all these laws and regulations to protect us, there are tens of thousands of chemicals like this that are unregulated and that present potential harm to us. Yet the exposed people are told, you have to be used as essentially guinea pigs to see, you have to prove you're getting sick from this. You have to wait until you've actually got cancer or been killed before you can bring claims in court. So hopefully by sharing these stories and having the discussion, and I apologize for talking so long, the discussion we're having here today, that helps people understand the way this system really works and the what needs to be done to help people who are exposed, particularly to chemicals in the environment, to actually be able to do something about it. You know, chemicals that we take in our body purposely, like drugs, regulated a very different way in the United States. They have to be shown to be safe to humans before they're brought out. But if you're exposed to something like forever chemicals that we know will get in your blood, the same as if you had been injected with it. You as the exposed person, you're the one who has the burden to prove that it's not safe. And as you see in the film, you see in this story, the incredible difficulties that presents to people who are exposed, who find out this is there and are trying to get something done about it. And hopefully by sharing this story, all of us can come up with a better way to do this and a better way to protect people who do believe now, and we're seeing this discussed, People should have a right not only to clean water, but to clean blood as well. So I appreciate the opportunity to be on this panel. I look forward to, to, to talking with the rest of you and thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Mr. Belot. It's, it's um, so powerful, your presentation. The film itself is already extremely powerful, um, but your, your appeal here is just, I mean, it's mind boggling what's really happening in terms of, uh, the international right to clean water. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask, uh, the, I will present the special rapporteur in more detail, and then we'll ask the rapporteur um, to do his presentation, and then we'll take all the questions uh, together. That's, I think, the, the best way forward. So Mr. Pedro Arojo Agudo is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights to Safe Drinking Water and Sanitation, and has been rapporteur since November 2020. From 2016 to 2019, Mr. Arojo Agudo served as an elected member of the Spanish Parliament. He was professor in the area of fundamentals of economic analysis at the University of Zaragoza from 1989 to 2011, and has been professor emeritus since 2011. During the last three decades, he has focused his research on economics and water management, publishing his work in more than 100 scientific articles and in 70 books. Um, I'm extremely honored to welcome him here today, as I am in relation to all the panelists. So for my hand over to Mr. Uh, Agudo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, it's a great honor to me uh, to be here with all of you. Uh, so yes, as you said, uh, I have received this uh, great honor to be appointed as a special rapporteur on this uh, on the 
human rights to save drinking water and sanitation from the 1st November. For me, it's a great honor, but at the same time, it's a, a overwhelming uh, challenge. Uh, as overwhelming it is, as, uh, as uh, exciting also, of course. So, well, um, you asked me to, to, to present shortly uh, my main concerns and uh, the, uh, my lines of uh, work uh, for my mandate. So I will explain to you very shortly, well, of course, the, the, the issues to which I want to pay special attention are different. Uh, uh, I, I, will, I will tell you, for instance, uh, first, I think sanitation uh, in many impoverished rural areas remains a, a major challenge, especially for women and girls. Uh, urgent attention to indigenous communities and people uh, with regard to the fulfillment of uh, human rights to safe drinking water and sanitation is another, another issue. In fact, it will be uh, one of my thematic reports probably for the next year. Uh, I believe that it is essential to develop a gender vision, of course, empowering uh, women as uh, active promoters and defenders of these human rights and not only as victims. I am also extremely concerned about, uh, and this is the topic you are dealing with in this meeting, in this event now, extremely uh, uh, concerned about the systematic growth of toxic pollutants, uh, such as heavy metals and pesticides and others in rivers, lakes, aquifers, and therefore, finally, in drinking water, even when it is chlorinated and supplied by, uh, through uh, improved, improved systems. Uh, I'm also deeply concerned about commodification and financialization of water, especially after knowing uh, that water start uh, trading in Wall Street future markets, isn't it? Well, also, I think attention must uh, be paid to the problems in refugee camps and in the suburbs of big cities, whose growth threatens to skyrocket uh, with millions of climate migrants and refugees in a future that, uh, that we are already beginning to touch. It's not so far away. And finally, I think we need to reinforce our support uh, for human rights defenders who are threatened and even killed as happened in fact. And this is the reason because I am so, so deeply uh, uh, committed with this, with this question. Uh, as I said, as happened with my friend Berta Cáceres uh, in, in Honduras some years ago. Uh, in many cases, this uh, is uh, defending, as in the case of Berta Cáceres, defending water and rivers. Well, um, as reporter, as you know, I have the obligation to present two thematic reports uh, every year. Uh, one before uh, the uh, Human Rights Council in Geneva, uh, and the other before the UN General Assembly in New York uh, in October, I think. Uh, and then I have also to, to, to organize uh, two uh, official national visits, uh, but uh, before I need to, to, to receive, this is a problem, uh, the invitation from the government. Well, I will focus mainly in, the, in this time, this, this limited time, on the two uh, questions that I will focus in my, these two first reports, thematic reports. Well, uh, the first thematic report uh, will focus uh, on my mandate plan, uh, but after analyzing the context uh, uh, in which I will have, we will have to work for the future, for the present and for the future. Uh, and I used to talk to, to talk about uh, in a sort of provocative way, uh, I used to, 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 to talk uh, uh, on the, um, uh, that I call uh, the global water crisis on the water planet. Well, the blue planet. The fact that 2.2 billion people do not have guaranteed access to safe drinking water. Uh, 
well, uh, this this gave the, the possibility, of course, of, of talking about a, a global water crisis. But I am uh, conscious uh, that uh, complementing this characterization with the reference to the water planet could be controversial in view of the argument that most of the water in the world is not fresh water, of course, but salt water. Uh, uh, Thus, the argument of scarcity uh, and the so-called uh, hydrological imbalances sometimes um, tend to emerge as the key to the diagnosis uh, of this global crisis. Undoubtedly, there are problems of water scarcity, in fact, in many regions of the world, and these problems tend to be exacerbated by, by ongoing climate change. Um, but uh, I insist, uh, when we talk about these 2.2 billion people without say, access to safe drinking water, we are not talking about uh, pe thirsty people without water in their uh, living environment. We are talking, in fact, uh, on 2.2 billion of impoverished people living next to a polluted river or on a uh, polluted aquifer. Uh, in this sense, from my point of view, the roots of this global water crisis lie uh, at the confluence of two major critical structural flaws. The flow of unsustainability that we have caused in our aquatic ecosystems, transforming in fact water, the key factor of life, into the most terrible vector of disease and death ever known. And the second is the flow of inequality and poverty on the deeply immoral uh, socioeconomic systems, from my point of view. And well, of course, uh, well, uh, under this perspective, uh, with, with respect to the first issue in which you are, uh, we are focused in this, in this event, I used to say, that uh, concerning my specific topic of uh, around the, the human rights to safe drinking water and sanitation and thinking on these 2.2 billion people, I used to say it will be nearly impossible to get uh, to, to achieve the, the goal of uh, fulfillment, the effective fulfillment of the human right to safe drinking water and sanitation for these 2.2 billion of impoverished public people if we are not able to make uh, clear progress, uh, progresses on, on improving, on recovering uh, the, the, the health and the sustainability of the rivers and the aquifers uh, from which they, they, they have to, to supply themselves. Uh, because of course we can think on the possibilities of technological possibilities uh, for depurating the water. I don't know, of course, of these rivers, we can uh, have uh, 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 desalination, well, uh, plants for depurating with uh, inverse osmosis. Uh, or building huge long uh, distances, transfers and so on. But this is not affordable for the people we are talking about. So the, 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 the only way uh, to, to, to really uh, progress in the fulfillment uh, of the effective access to safe drinking water and sanitation for these people is to make peace to the rivers and to the aquifers, to the ecosystems, aquatic ecosystems. No? This is for me a key issue. And this is why I'm, uh, I'm beginning to work together very closely uh, with other special reporters, but more specifically, uh, specifically with, uh, with David Boyd, uh, the, the, the special reporter on, on, on uh, environment. You know? Well, um, of course, uh, when, when I, I talk about this, this crisis uh, on the, these two main uh, uh, key uh, flaws of uh, uh, failures, you know, uh, global failures, uh, afterwards, of course, we, we need to, 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 to remark, uh, to point out that uh, to make matters worse, today uh, we are suffering from the action of three factors 
that aggravate and deepen this global water crisis. The commodification and financialization of water, first one, climate change, second, and the COVID-19 pandemic, of course. And so very shortly, and I uh, finish, from the prevailing neoliberal view, uh, water tends to be considered as a simple economic resource, useful and scarce, uh, which should be managed according to the logic of market. Uh, well, from this mercantilist uh, vision that we transforms uh, citizens into, into more customers, clients. Uh, but in this sense, uh, what about these 2. B, 2 billion people that we talked before? Uh, well, we transform these 2.2 billion people in 2.2 billion uh, impoverished clients that cannot pay for, for, the, for the services. So uh, making more vulnerable the ones who were before vulnerable, we are uh, worsening, uh, aggravating uh, this, this crisis instead of facing it or improving it. So this is one, uh, where, where, one why I think uh, this is one of the, of the elements of the factors that aggravate and deepen this global crisis. Of course, uh, global, uh, the, 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 the climate change uh, is another element uh, and is very clear uh, for the impacts on the environment uh, and also of the most, uh, uh, on the population. So that the key issues are uh, uh, recovering or reinforcing uh, the environmental resilience once again recovering the the good the, the health and the sustainability of aquatic ecosystem and on the other hand uh, uh, reinforcing the uh, the social resiliency in this case with the uh, fulfillment uh, of the human rights uh, not just to, in this case to say bringing water and sanitation as a very very basic element of this uh, social resiliency and of course with respect to the COVID uh, we know already uh, what is happening and how the, the crisis the, the health crisis public health crisis is uh, in deepening uh, uh, and expanding uh, the inequalities problem and the poverty around the world. Uh, so in this sense, uh, the COVID and the, the, the crisis on public health is uh, also another factor of uh, aggravating and deepening uh, the, 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 the global water crisis on the, on the water planet. Uh, the second, and I finish with this, the second report, uh, to the uh, General Assembly of the United Nations, I think it will be in it will be in, in October. Uh, will uh, will focused on the uh, commodification and financialization of water, the risks and impacts uh, that will come from this from this process. Uh, well, uh, for me, we have the experience of uh, dealing with. Uh, um, basic food products uh, on these uh, future markets that are from the 90s, from the end of the 20th century, beginning of this century, under the, uh, the absolute control and uh, uh, domination of the main banks, the big banks, uh, and uh, uh, financial institutions uh, that, has, uh, that impose the logic of the, uh, uh, the, the speculative logic. Uh, and in fact, the, the, the result has been just the opposite that, it, that they are uh, presenting as the justification for dealing with water in, this, in these markets in order, to, um, uh, in order to improve the management of scarcity in the perspective under the perspective of the climate change. Uh, if we look at uh, what has been the results, the empirical results with, uh, with food, we see uh, the disaster of the, the, the prices of food in 2008 
just the moment where, where, where when the, the, the bubble of the financial bubble uh, has exploded. In this moment, uh, the, the big banks, uh, the, the large banks and, the, and, and the institutions, uh, financial institutions uh, devoted to, the, to, to this, to this um, future markets on, on, on food more than uh, uh, $350 billion in some months. In some months, the, the, the prices uh, skyrocketed, uh, skyrocketed and uh, uh, multiplying prices by four, by five even. Uh, and the result in this point was uh, more, more or less uh, uh, 200, 200 million uh, new uh, people uh, in the uh, starving situation uh, around the world. So um, I, I think it's not the way. Um, we, we need to, to focus on the democratization, uh, on the democratic governance of water as a, uh, as a common good of public interest. And so under the perspective and the coherence uh, of uh, the uh, of the general interest of society, sustainability and equity. So this will be my my second uh, thematic report for this year. And well, um, of course, there will be then uh, other topics to 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 touch and to develop in the the next years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Arojo Agudo. Um, there's a lot of information there, and I think we'll be looking forward to, to reading your reports and a lot of overlap uh, with other issues raised. I will also actually, on the issue of commoditization of the water industry, I will share a link uh, of investigative journalism by Liana um, in terms of privatized UK water companies. Uh, dumping untreated sewage into the, the water system. So in terms of the, the issues that arise through a privatization of water, etc., there, there are significant problems there that do not, as, as you've uh, raised, do not really help with the cleanup or the, the enforcement of the right to clean and safe drinking water. Um, before we uh, go on to the questions, I am giving the floor to Mr. Kai Gbangbola. He's Zane Study, a tireless campaigner for Truth About Zane campaign. And I will mention it, although he hasn't asked me to and has asked me not to, he is the founder of an award-winning sustainability consultancy, Total Eco Management Limited. He's also a member of the All-Party Parliamentary Climate Change Group. Again, a topic that has been raised by the special rapporteur and is one that uh, is obviously of uh, immense importance to the whole issue of the right to clean drinking water. So I will start this by a screen share. I will show a small film provided um, by Kai and I am hoping it will work.
Now it's the turn of the northwest of England to feel the full force of the storms battering Britain. The Met Office has issued a red alert, meaning a danger to life, as rain and hurricane force winds are lashing the northwest coast tonight. It's playing havoc with transport links, with the N6 closed, cruise station evacuated, some rail lines suspended. We're now back to the flooding, and all the evidence says the Met Office points to climate change. Their latest research has been tracking the changing patterns which have led to these unprecedented Presidented storms. Our weather presenter, Liam Dutton, what's going on there? Well, it's astonishing, John, the weather we've seen over the past two months. Storm after storm slamming into our shores. And of course, yesterday the Met Office said that all the evidence points to climate change playing a huge role in this. And uh, it's first time they've said that. It is, and it could just be the case we see more and more of this as we head into the future. Tonight on BBC London News, could this seven-year-old have died as a result of poisoning during the winter floods? His fam family claim their search for answers is being blocked. It's been more than four months since the flood floodwaters receded here. And yet, the sandbags, the pumps, are evidence of how this is a home caught in a single moment in time. The night saying died. The family believe that on that night, contaminated flood water from a former landfill site filled their basement. As theirs was the only one open to the soil, their theory is that poisonous vapour then infused the house. Kai lost consciousness and awoke in intensive care, only to be told his son had died. So far, no post-mortem has been able to establish Zane's death. His father says he and his son suffered from hydrogen cyanide poisoning. When these concerns were put to Surrey County Council, they denied the site of the rear of the property had ever been used as a landfill, saying, think carefully about spreading panic among local residents. In an official statement, they went on to say, Abbey Field is a landscape lake area created as a result of mineral excavation and has not been a landfill site. Now it's emerged that a simple property search carried out by any homeowner will reveal the area is recorded as landfill. This is the property. At the rear, shaded brown, a local authority recorded landfill site. Once more, the report says there is the potential for significant ground contamination to exist. No site visit was made, but this is all based on information from Surrey County Council. And here's a similar search on the Environment Agency's website. The pink shows historic landfill, again, right next to their home. So what do the council have to say now? In a statement, they said simply, police are investigating this sad case and are waiting on the results of the tests. So it wouldn't be appropriate to speculate on the cause of death until they have.
We will not back down. We will not be silenced. We want the truth to say, and we call for an independent panel inquiry. Thank you, Kai. I'd like to hand over to you to take it from here. It's a very powerful uh, short film you've provided us with. Thank you, Jan, speakers, and thank you for inviting me. By now, you have certainly gathered that I'm Zane's father. Zane's mother, Nicole, and I, though grieving, must face this nightmare. The loss of a child is unbearable. But we stand both for truth for Zane and for public protection. Zane is the intersection of the two films, Dark Waters and First D for Justice. Chemicals harming people, absolutely. But we experienced an acute attack during flooding attributed to changing climate. Landfill was also a factor. In Britain right now, landfill is a headline news item according to the British Medical Journal, you'll find that 80% of people in the UK live within two kilometres of landfill. Many landfills are a ticking time bomb. Throughout what follows, please never lose sight of the fact that a seven-year-old child died horribly. And we need help from the likes of those that are on this panel who know how lonely fights for justice are for grieving parents. On the day that little Zane died, the truth was known within minutes. Expert hazmat detected hydrogen cyanide resulting in many authorities being notified about the nerve agent. All this was whilst Zane's little family fought for their lives in hospital with cyanide in their blood. The whole area was evacuated. Many people and emergency services needed decontamination. Porton Down, the world premier chemical weapons agency, were flown in. Emergency Cobra meetings were convened, attended by the Prime Minister. These are the highest level of UK national security reserved for terrorist attacks and nerve agent events such as Salisbury poisonings. Emergency Cobras help to decide the messaging that the public should hear. The BBC recently ex re-exposed what the media was told and what Zane, at, at the day that Zane died, and who said it. The BBC reported within hours of Zane's death the press release of number 10 Downing Street spokesman stated, the little boy in Chertsey died from carbon monoxide poisoning caused by petrol pumps and generators used by the family to clear flood water from their home. This is a complete fabrication. It willfully misdirected the press and the public. Now you might ask at this point, how is it the invisible odorless hydrogen cyanide, the nerve agent chemical weapon of mass destruction used to kill people in gas chambers in World War II was actually detected, but number 10 says that it was carbon monoxide. Well, we don't know the answer to that question and perhaps the clue is, is in that question. But what can be confirmed is no carbon monoxide was detected in our all electric Victorian house using electric pumps. This situation contributed to calls for an independent panel inquiry backed by over 110,000 petitioners, political parties with Zane's fight for justice in their manifestos, unions, celebrities, etc. Now, I really wish I could stop there, but sadly, much more abuse is evident. Suffice to say, authorities that are meant to protect us came forward to attack. The National Incident Record Book on the day 
states very high levels of hydrogen cyanide were detected in Zane's home. That report also states information must be redacted to prevent sensitive information getting into the public domain. At this point, I would like you to know that the land a few yards away from where Zane was killed has a 2010 geotechnical report. And that report was commissioned by the Environment Agency prior to constructing a new property that they needed. And that report states, there are migrating landfill gases. The risk is high. The consequences are serious injury and death. 2010 was four years before Zane died. Zane's death was preventable. Authorities were forewarned. What happened next will shock you. The Environment Agency placed a gas proof membrane in their new property to stop dangerous gases getting in and killing its staff. They told none of the neighbours about the danger the Environment Agency's gas protected property was less than 10 yards from where Zane died. In addition, this secret landfill has a history of poisoning people, gases over nine times acceptable levels, horses found dead, plus its nearby sister site was remediated for, you've guessed it, cyanide in 2011. The inquest for Zane was a disgrace, but it was a masterclass in collusion and how to make a predetermined political decision a plausible outcome. Zane's rights were stripped from him by an inquest. There was no investigation and we were refused a jury. The inquest used state authorities marking their own homework to protect themselves and corporate interests over public safety. We had a phalanx of five legal teams against us, multi-billion turnover per annum organizations who had their legal costs paid for by you, the public. Whilst we had to beg, borrow and crowdfund 75,000 pounds to pay for representation because legal aid was refused to us three times. Now speaking diplomatically, this is an obscene inequality of arms. It was akin to six Goliaths armed to the teeth attacking one naked unarmed David. Yes, even the coroner had an additional legal team paid for at the public's expense. There being no jury, the coroner sat as judge and jury, and he decided that Zane was poisoned by carbon monoxide, a substance not even detected and for which there was no medical evidence. I was two yards from Zane. My diagnosis is paraplegia due to hydrogen cyanide poisoning, and this was uninvestigated. Matt Rack, one of the country's most highly respected union leaders from the Fire Brigade Union, said, our members detected cyanide and have serious concerns at how Zane's inquest was conducted and the disturbing gaps in the evidence. The unregulated landfill seems to have released nerve agent and we call for an independent panel inquiry to investigate properly. Seeing the abuses perpetrated upon us, we and the Fire Brigade Union have been joined by various other unions. These include the TUC, Unite, Unison, the Communication Workers Union, PCS, the National Education Union. The Green Party and the Labour Party are also key supporters. Even local elected Conservative led officials cried foul, demanding the Prime Minister give Zane an independent panel inquiry. And in their words, it, this is on account of the cover up. 
Nicole and I would like to thank those supporters and unions from the bottom of our hearts. When we and citizens stand together in troubled times, we can achieve amazing things. The people supported by unions are truly mighty. We must ask ourselves, what kind of a developed country strips children of their human rights and does not investigate a nerve agent, hydrogen cyanide, a chemical weapon of mass destruction, or where it came from. Zane's mummy, Nicole, fought valiantly to try and resuscitate Zane till the air ambulance and local ambulance service arrived. Had Zane, had, had Nicole not raised the alarm, many could have died that night. If you want to know what I was doing, I was in cardiac arrest and unconscious. I was unable to help Nicole. Our former Prime Minister, Theresa May, talks of chemical gases choking the lungs of little ones in Syria. Quite right. But she didn't care when it happened to my little boy in Surrey. Make no mistakes. Cases of injustice, state corporate crime and cover-ups are often obscured by a type of bureaucratic violence upon the victims perpetrated by public authorities who have become conduits of corporate power. This situation becomes exacerbated by the removal of the checks and balances, standards and regulations. And these are removed to ensure that we are left unprotected. And the truth is inaccessible. As children, at Zane School put it, why didn't the adults just tell the truth? I was very, very proud of my boy Zane. He would have been 14 last birthday. When Zane was six, he said when he was interviewed, sustainability and being green is not just about tidying up your own garden. It's about keeping tidy an even bigger garden that belongs to everyone. I want you to hear Zane's own words to know the kindness, care and compassion that he had for everyone. I emphasise we will never win. Zane will never win. Zane's been taken from us. All we can do now is expose the truth and protect others. Whatever one thinks, whatever one thinks, Zane deserves a proper, full and fearless investigation by independent panel inquiry with full powers to compel disclosure. And I know Rob knows a lot about disclosure. So what can you do to help? As we advance to truth, there are lots of ways in which you can help to get Zane's voice heard. You can pre-order a special book that we wrote about what happened and that's due out later this year, but the first 2000 people to pre-order will receive a special limited edition hard copy. Uh, and that is uh, with, their, with their name in it. Or you can donate to Zane's GoFundMe. All of these proceeds are to help fund the book's publication. Please also sign Zane's petition and share his story. So many more people get to know what happened. Links are in the chat and whistleblowers, please do come forward and do the right thing. Like Alexei Navalny and Dawn Sturges, we are simply innocent people poisoned by nerve agent. But like them, Zane deserves the truth. What you have heard is only the tip of the iceberg. You can find out more by going to Zane's website at www.truthaboutzane.co.uk. Let Zane's name be cherished and be the cause of truth. Nobody wants to think their children aren't safe when they have tucked them into bed at night. Rest in peace, Zane. Extra hugs to all of your children and blessings to you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kai. Um, it's hard to find any words to lead on from that. 
Uh, your, your son just, uh, I think he was just an amazing human being, quite clearly. He, he was just a real angel. He seems to have been just far advanced in his years. And I think you're doing everything he would have done and that he was already doing. So I think you're creating this amazing awareness, which isn't going to help to deal with a loss, but I think you're doing a huge public service. And I think what you're saying uh, there to protect others is exactly that message uh, that, that needs to go out there. And what I found very striking, both with your story and that of Earl Tennant that Rob Bilot covered in the film Dark Water, is that if you forgive me for using the words, but that the victims are blamed for what has happened. So, and often in very, very humiliating ways. As you say, said, it was your family that was then made, you know, blamed for supposedly being responsible by being uh, told that it's due to carbon monoxide that they died. I mean, there can be hardly anything more, more painful than first of all, losing your son and then being blamed for his death. And uh, the same mechanism uh, we, we, we saw with, with Earl Tennant, the farmer that, that Rob held, who was, you know, who was blamed then for the death of, of all his cows. So he was, his, his pride was then being attacked by stating that uh, he hadn't looked after, uh, after his farm, after his family, of, after, uh, you know, his animals, etc. So it's, it's really incredible how uh, the system sometimes works then to to apportion the blame to try to devoid the, the person who's the victim of the natural sympathy they would be getting um, so that people when they hear it they think oh well it's their fault so I can just move on and, and ignore the whole thing and then when you look into it and I think that's what, what Mr. Bilot has, has outlined if you have this trust in the system that the system actually works then you think, oh, maybe this is all some kind of a conspiracy theory. And it's shocking when you dig and you realize the person was actually right. And what they felt instinctively was always true. But it was this misleading uh, by the authorities or also in this case, in both cases, the failure to actually release all the documents. Um, so the ongoing uh, disclosure struggles and then in Kai's case, you know, there's still documents that still need to be released and that have been redacted. Um, and there's a wonderful quote in, in the film Dark Waters. So if you forgive me, I will try, before we get to the questions, I will actually try to play that clip which has the quote in it. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? Yes. 
They have all the money, all the fire power, and no you use it. I know. I was one of them. Our government is captive to do pop. They're trying to force you to make me stop. He was willing to risk his job, his family, or a stranger who needed his help. The system is rigged. They want us to think it'll protect us. We protect us. We do. So yes, I think that that iconic quote, you know, we, we expect regulatory author authorities, we, we expect the state, et cetera, to protect us, but, but it isn't happening. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, uh, and, the, and the fights are all still ongoing. So I'm going to go to, we've had excellent questions. So I'm, I'm going to open the floor to those questions and read them out. So first of all, to Liana, um, first for just- Is fresh with the press? Absolutely. Oh, sorry. In the beginning, I was doubtful too, until I realized- Was it My a catch up on, um, on what's going on with the communities now? Okay. So yes. Um, so the question was, I'll, I'll read it out fully. There was just a, a YouTube video playing. So first for justice, was filmed under the Trump administration. Has there been any sign of change on this issue under the Biden administration? So that is uh, a question from Jane Hyde. Okay, so I mean, and listening to all the other speakers, I mean, there's so much crossover from, from what I saw and from what's happening in the US and also what's happening here in the UK. Um, I don't think we can all feel <laughs> totally relaxed just because um, uh, you know some of these examples have come out in the US. So in Flint, Michigan, they um, it wasn't so much Biden, but they had a new um, kind of state state level election. So they had a Democrat. So Rick Snyder, the governor, the Republican governor was voted out and you had a Democrat governor put in and initially she kind of dropped all of the um, criminal charges because under um, under Snyder, really, it's the Attorney General, the Republican Attorney General, Bill Shuley. There were these criminal charges, but um, the new administration, kind of uh, the new local state administration, dropped that and reinvestigated. And so, yeah, you've got nine people, including Rick Snyder, the former governor of Michigan, now being charged um, for for um, the deadly water crisis that poisoned that community and uh, on the positive side they have received um you know they have received some money in in a civil um case they're still trying to get more because it's you know it's, i mean what's going to really you know at least 12 people died at least and that's probably a huge underestimation so um you know what price is your health really um about also, there has been some pipe replacement. Some of the, you know, the lead pipes in the city have been replaced, you know. Um, so that is a positive thing. A lot of the um, residents might say, well, what if we've got lead pipes in our homes, which are ruined or, um, but that's, that's not being addressed. That's not going to be addressed. And on the Navajo Nation, um, there has been some um, money by, um, I think I showed their little video the, of the Uranium company Kermagee, who are now uh, Tronox, and they gave a settlement of like a billion dollars. So um, there is some cleanup, but it's it's not enough, and it's certainly not going to be enough at all. And one Navajo EPA official told me it's going to take like a hundred years, or you know, or or, or more. Um, so that's that's the situation at the moment. It continues, you know. Um, and then, as I said, you know, this sort of, um, I don't think we necessarily need to feel safe here in the UK. Um, you know, there's a complete lack of, lack of testing here in the UK. Um, just, you know, I did a piece last week about, you know, illegal billions of litres of, um, 
of raw sewage is just illegally dumped into the river all the time. So um, that's, you know, that's the environment agency, you know, they're not being, um, they're not cracking down maybe as, as hard as they, they should be, you know, obviously we heard from about Zane's issue as well. So yeah, I'll hand back. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, uh, Liana. Uh, one of the other questions asked to you was, how is the US media covering the issues raised by your film, Thirst for Justice? What happened, what's been going on on the Navajo Nation with this massive uranium um, contamination from the historic um, land um, mine sites and milling sites? I mean, I maxed out the Geiger counter. I got the most radioactive levels that it could reach, you know, areas around Chernobyl, uh, you know, are lower and they've been evacuated for the long term. Um, but there hasn't been that much media coverage of what's been going on in the Navajo Nation. So um, not, not national media coverage either. And it's same, goes for Standing Rock. You know, you had 10,000 people in ceremonial sort of camp blocking this major pipeline. And it went on for about a year. And um, I was, uh, you know, I got to meet, you know, I was, I was on a journalism fellowship there. So I got to meet, you know, people, editors at the Wall Street Post and, and so forth. And um, it didn't even come up in their editorial meetings, they said. And I said, but at least that's a, you know, Wall Street Journal, at least that's a business story, <laughs> you know, but none of the, you know, it, it barely kind of reached the mainstream. And I did feel, you know, when it came to eviction and there are a number of you know, reasons why, you know, I think, you know, the, the, it did come to eviction and the tribal chief allowed the police to come in. Um, but I was happy to see the local media there because I thought, okay, you know, people aren't gonna get horribly, <laughs> beaten up it's it's you know because the media i was on there at least the local you know local state media so um and in flint obviously you know it took so much for flint to get that coverage it took um you know the residents had been complaining for years you know going to city hall with bags of their hair and jugs of brown water and they were told by the private water company that who, who were brought in and they said well you know some people react badly to water and just because it's not clear you know just because it's a different color doesn't mean it's bad <laughs> I mean, it's just unbelievable like when the uranium guy says you can eat you know yellow cake uh, enriched uranium wow because it's not very radioactive I mean the kind of the you know the lies people are having to face. And then, you know, they got a scientist who proved that there's lead in water, but that wasn't enough. He was rubbished. And then you had this pediatrician who had all the blood lead data of all the children and correlated it with the, the rise in, in lead in water. And still she, that wasn't enough. And she was rubbished and called hysterical. And then, you know, then they voted in a new mayor on the platform of, um, you know, declaring a state of emergency. And that's when they got onto the Rachel Maddow's show. And that's when they got the media. This took years, you know, and had, you know, there was a lot of dedicated uh, people and uh, who, who made that happen, so. Thank you very much uh, for your answer, Liana. Um, there, there are plenty of very good questions. So I'm going on to the next one. So. For Rob Bilot, um, from Shadia, first of all, starstruck, you're amazing. Your story had me in tears, not just for the content of Bucky Bailey, but because of your personal efforts and struggle over an enormous amount of time against what seemed like the impossible. My question is what differences, if any, have you noted since your victory over DuPont for those embarking on or involved in any similar David and Goliath struggles today? And what would you say to anyone attempting what you attempted in relevant environmental contexts today. Well, thanks for the question, and uh, you know, it's it's been fascinating to watch. You know, we've had a similar issue with public awareness of Forever Chemicals that you heard from Leanna about, you know, getting the story out about Flint or what was happening in the in the Navajo 
nation, you know, just it, it took a long time to be able to get this information out and to be able to have people actually understand what was happening. Um, you know, as since since the events that you see in the film Dark Waters, uh, you know, the, the, the testing has really started to begin in the U.S. and water supplies all over the country are finally uh, testing for these chemicals and people all over the country in the United States are learning for the first time that these chemicals are there and are demanding you know information about what are the health effects what in uh, how do we get this out of our water and who should be paying for this you know there are companies that knowingly put these chemicals out knowing they would get in the water and stay there knowing they would build up in our blood made billions of dollars in profits from doing that yet are denying responsibility now as you know water supplies all over the country are facing millions of dollars to put filtration systems in uh, and this is all over and it's happening worldwide uh, and and unfortunately there are a lot of places where the testing hasn't happened or is just now beginning uh, so people don't even realize uh, that they have been exposed and may be continuing to be exposed. But, you know, having having the vehicle of the film, Dark Waters, in the documentary, I think we finally started to see the conversation occur on a more national basis. You know, this is a story that I think, you know, we first started sending letters to the US EPA in 2001. And you, and if those of you saw the film, you saw there was some national media coverage around 2003, yet it all just kind of went away again. As the company said, well, we're voluntarily phasing these out. The US EPA jumped in and said, well, these are being phased out, essentially went away. And it took the communities, you know, spending years to confirm that these chemicals cause these health effects, you know, to, and to finally get that story out that people started finally hearing about this. Um, and you know, it's, I think it's a testament to the power of having conversations like this, being able to see films like what Leanna is working on, you know, to get those stories out to people so that they understand uh, why this is important, why things are happening, like you heard from Kai, you know, that the, the tragedy with his son, that these, these things are happening. And you know, that the, we, it's, it's unfortunate what's happened in our media uh, recently as everything is moving to these very quick sound bites and people are getting fed information that only what they're choosing to see, you know, that there's, there's, there's very minimal, it, there's not as much investigative journalism as there used to be of people who are able to actually dig into these stories and actually spend the time necessary to, to explain them to people. Everything has to be converted into very quick sound bites. And stories like this that involve complicated chemical names and science, a lot of times that's seen as that's too complicated, you know, and we'll, we'll move on to the next thing. Uh, and, you know, it's, I think it's incredibly important for people to find ways to transcend these different worlds to have scientists get out of just their scientific silo and the regulators and the lawyers and the media and find ways to to tell these stories that that cross all of those spectra and to be able to to touch people in all these different groups and you know to me it was fascinating to watch the folks at participants you know screenwriters being able to to bring stories like this that are complicated out into to, in an understandable way um, so again, I'm you know delighted that we're having this discussion, and that everybody on this panel you know are is able to to get these stories out, and people are talking about them because if anything, it shows things can change when people stand up, speak out, and demand that things be done differently. It can happen. It 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 is happening, and uh, there are, uh, you know I'm hoping people are inspired by that. Thank you very much. I think no doubt you massively inspired people and you're quite right. I think the issue of the media and probably also the issue of media ownership, which we're facing in the UK a lot. I mean, um, one of the criticisms has been that, that uh, a lot of media didn't cover the effects of climate change and the climate catastrophe, uh, considering what a huge issue that is. And uh, Extinction Rebellion, for that reason, covered did a one day stunt where they stopped 
papers from going out from the broadsheets that were just quite simply not covering that issue. So I think there's also the issue again of who finances newspapers, you know, who 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 has financial interests in this, because no doubt that that is linked. Um, and as you rightly stated, and I think uh, Liana is a is a very notable exception, is that um, there is much investment into investigative journalism. I mean, your work it depicted in the film covered 20 years, and, and investigative journalism isn't something that can just be carried out, you know, within a day or two. So it does require efforts, but it does require um, money and funding. But it's worth every penny. And uh, of course, a lot of authorities are not interested in uh, people probing, uh, whether on a local level or on a national level, or um, yeah, so so or in a company on a company level. So I think these are really vital points um, you've made, and you've definitely been hugely inspiring and reached a much bigger audience through your film than probably would have otherwise been expected. Um, I've got a question for Mr. Arojo Agudo. What is the response or engagement from the UK government, and I shall add from the US government, on these issues? Um, and does your mandate have any standing invitation from the UK government or the US government for a fact-finding mission? Can you repeat, please? Yes, yes. So the question was, um, what is the response or engagement to, let's say, your reports um, or any letters of communication by either the US government or the UK government? And have either of these governments issued you with a standing invitation to come and um, look into the situation in terms of the human right to clean drinking water and sanitation? Well, for the moment, I, I didn't address, I, uh, I've just, just begin my mandate on November, as, as I said. Uh, so I have a don't, I didn't address a letter of allegation uh, to, to the US, and, uh, no, to, the, to the UK government. Um, my, my men, uh, for the moment, I have addressed uh, um, letters of allegation to different governments in Latin America, in, uh, in Europe also, uh, with res regarding the um, uh, disconnection, water disconnections during the pandemic, uh, during the pandemic uh, crisis. Uh, on uh, taking about well, uh, uh, underlining that that. Uh, um, the access to safe drinking water and sanitation is a human right and it is not allowed uh, internationally to cut water to families that are in uh, an impoverished situation of vulnerability. Uh, so it has been one of my uh, the questions that I have followed up uh, during the pandemic and are asking for uh, changes for reforming laws in order to, as we say in Spanish, to, to uh, tra uh, hacer de la necesidad virtud, to transform the need uh, uh, that in this case we have for, for facing in an effective way the, the pandemic, to change this need in the permanent virtue uh, of changing laws for uh, prohibiting uh, cuts of um, um, water disconnections uh, for families that are in, in a vulnerable or a situation of poverty uh, with pandemic or without, you know. Uh, so this is one of, my, of the questions. Uh, with, uh, related with, uh, with toxic pollution or with pollution in general, I am very interested in, in fact, is, a, uh, is one of, my, of the topics I want to devote uh, one of my in the future in the next year probably on the, uh, um, to to the one of my thematic reports uh, I would like to to focus on the impact of pollution especially toxic pollution uh, on the bankruptcy of the human rights uh, to safe drinking water and sanitation but safe drinking water in this case because I think there are numerous well, I think is is obvious there are numerous data 
uh, a lot of data on the impact of biological contamination and the consequent diarrhea uh, with hospital records and statistics. But toxic pollution uh, kills little by little uh, and no statistics, uh, statistics uh, not so much at least, I don't know, uh, are recorded, you know, heavy metals, pesticides and so on. Uh, it would take, uh, I would like to, 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 to have uh, um, in the future, no, called the collaboration of experts like you, Rob, uh, to develop uh, these this, uh, future reports. Uh, because I think very, very often when we talk uh, on, uh, on uh, improvements of, for instance, um, uh, pipe networks for, for uh, improved systems no, for providing uh, a chlorinated water is okay, is, is good, but doesn't, that, that doesn't mean that uh, this water is properly drinking water, you know? Uh, and the example I know but the best is, is Lima. No? Uh, the last time I came there, uh, I went to Lima. Uh, every time I am received with a big assembly of people, the last one, the last time was nearly 2,000 people no? um, with uh, trade unions that deal with, uh, with water in uh, the company of uh, public company of on, on water and sanitation in Lima. And they say, well, before you, you talk, Mr. Rojo, let us, uh, the engineers from the company, we have to explain to the people uh, something that is very grave. So, <laughs> and I was, I was impressed because the, the communication uh, was talking about the, the impossibility of giving to the people, nearly 9 million people now, uh, properly safe drinking water because upstream in the Rimac River, um, the mining uh, tilings, uh, you say in English, I think, now the mining tilings uh, from uh, the open cast uh, uh, mining, uh, old, uh, abandoned at, at present, but the, the mining tiling uh, are um, leaching uh, toxic uh, to the Rimac River and uh, that are not possible to depurate now. Uh, and for the future, for, for uh, uh, it's not just for three, four years, no, but, but, uh, but forever. Uh, so it is terrible, nine million people without safe drinking water. But I'm sure that these people are not accounted as people that not, don't, doesn't, uh, don't receive uh, drinking water, safe drinking water, because it is Pipe, pipe to water, chlorinated water. So I'm sure that it is, it is probably uh, considered um, officially as drinking water. So I, 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 I would like to, to, to enter in this question in order to clarify uh, what happens with, with the impact of toxic pollution on, uh, on drinking water around the world. So I will need your help and the other people, of course. Right, because they only in the US, I know they only test for 99 contaminants in your drinking water, but there's thousands and thousands of uh, like 8,000 8, maybe unregulated chemicals out there. Absolutely. I mean, it's probably a lot more than that. Um, and, you know, we only found out about these forever chemicals because of a farmer with cows getting sick. Uh, you know, we may never have even understood that these were out there without that having happened. So it really sort of highlights the problem uh, with knowing, trying to figure out what else is out there uh, that we haven't thoroughly understood or even investigated at this point. So um, these, these are incredibly important questions. And you know, again, you know, as you, as you, as a special rapporteur indicated, you know, folks would assume well, if they're getting clean, filtered, you know, water through through these uh, approved systems, that everything's fine. And you know, unfortunately, what we're finding is more and more there are things in there that um, may be meeting all federal and state standards. Yet there, it, it's meeting it because there is no standard for the, for this toxin, even though we know the problem with the toxin. And look at this one chemical that we dealt with, PFOA. Despite everything that's known, the most comprehensive, massive human health studies ever done on a chemical showing and proving the connection with six diseases, including two types of cancer, we still can't get 
a, 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 a drinking water standard for that at the federal level in the United States. It's taken over 20 years. And we just had the announcement that the US EPA would move forward to do that. Yeah, it's gonna take several more years. So, you know, if that, it just really highlights the, 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 the systemic problem we have in the way in which we address clean water. One thing that perhaps could be interesting for me would be if you can uh, submit to me to send me uh, specific data uh, on this question in the US or in other countries in order to address uh, letter of allegation to the government and say, and then and, and we'll see what, the, what they say. No? Uh, but it will be interesting, but I need uh, concrete data and references in order to ask the government and to go into the problem. Terrific, absolutely. May I ask on this issue two, two questions? One, um, would you also be willing and happy to take on um, an individual case, for example, such as the issue of, of of truth about Zane, for example, with other special rapporteurs in a joint letter, special rapporteur on the right to health or um, other rapporteurs in terms of requesting, for example, further questions from the government about, about information that they haven't released, for example. Yes, could be. Uh, but perhaps in, in, in each case, uh, as you know, as you said, there are different uh, mandates. And uh, well, my case uh, could be specifically on uh, on uh, uh, water, drinking water or sanitation. So in this sense, yes, it could be my case. It would be, I, I could intervene and ask the government and require information or uh, ask for changing uh, the problems that are affecting in one way or another. Could be also an, an individual case, of course. That would be fantastic. And then I was wondering, would you, would you consider requesting if you do get a lot of information submitted, and, and I think there's no doubt there is a lot of information out there, it's just not that everyone knows how to submit information to UN mechanisms. I will put a list of the thematic UN mechanisms into the chat. So these are individual UN special rapporteurs, like the esteemed rapporteur who we have here today, and how you can submit information. Um, so, so in that sense, if you do get a lot of information submitted, for example, in relation to the US and the UK, would you be possibly willing to consider requesting the government for an invitation so that you could carry out a fact-finding mission to the UK or the US? Well, in general, uh, in uh, I have no, uh, I have a short experience, but according to the information I receive. Um, the possibilities of a special rapporteur when I receive, when we receive a, a claim, uh, a denounce on uh, something, um, I, my, my, I, I can talk with everyone, of course. I'm a, 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 an independent expert, so, and I am free, of course, of asking for, with all kinds of sources official and official universities, NGOs, et cetera, et cetera. But finally, uh, when I address something, when I want to change something, uh, my uh, interlocutor is the government exclusively. Uh, so if I, I address a letter, a letter of allegation, for instance, it doesn't matter the US government or any other government, um, I need to maintain a discreet uh, attitude uh, during three months. So I give three months to the government in order to not to be surprised by a press conference, for instance, or something like this about this question. Uh, and I need to, I, 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 the, 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 the advice to me is to wait for three months and to dialogue with the government during this time. And then after I can publish, I can make publish, I can, uh, have a public uh, dialogue with the uh, social groups that are involved or the affected people and so on. So in that moment, uh, the visibility of the debate, the denounce or the activity of the rapporteur uh, uh, taking in, the, in his, his hands uh, the denounce of uh, 
uh, NGO, a group, a person is public from that moment, but not before. Uh, the, the, there is these three months of diplomatic, uh, uh, I don't know how to say, diplomatic relationship with the government. That's excellent. Thank you very much. So uh, the idea that the government has three months to respond, and then if they don't, then the rapporteur. Um, so my experience for, for the, the president uh, rapporteur is uh, quite often they respond, but not uh, every time, not all the time. So, so uh, also is frequent that uh, don't receive any response or receiving a response that is not. But from that moment, I can intervene uh, publicly, you know, that is the difference. And, and that, that is a fantastic um, source. And I'm always very pleased when um, organizations make use of UN bodies. Um, of course, the UK government hasn't got a particularly good record. They have, for example, consistently ignored the UN Special Rapporteur on torture, Niels Meltzer, when it came to such uh, important cases like uh, Assange or the Overseas Operations Bill and things like that. I don't know whether the US government uh, government's record will be any better in the future, but I, don't, I, I certainly think it's worth trying. And of course, once something is written in a UN report, then in terms of getting national coverage or local news coverage, or maybe even quoting it into in, in cases or test cases can be uh, very helpful to have either recommendations by a rapporteur or uh, concluding observations by UN treaty bodies. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask another question. Um, uh, I, I've just uh, pasted them all here into documents. So um, to, to Kai, um, so emotional to see Zane behind you and yet always in front of you, of all you do. You and Zane's mummy are such an inspiration. How can the coroner or senior co coroner be made to look at this all again maybe by judicial review, sorry if that's already been tried, is a referral to the relevant UN Special Rapporteur possible, not just because of the right to life issue, but because of the wider implications environmentally and for others. The coroner's inquest sounds like it should have had a jury, um, sounds like it should be able to appeal or judicially review the coroner for conclusion if the, it is not medically supported. Thank you very much for that, Shadia. Um, and uh, a number of questions there. I'd just like to thank you, Jan, for uh, the point that you made. And of course, uh, we are keen to pursue uh, with Pedro or any rapporteurs um, any issues that will take the truth forward in terms of identifying information, evidence, facts, data, figures that are held um, because it is essential that we get the truth for Zane, as I said, and also for the protection of the wider public. Um, we know considerable amounts of detail and a lot of what others have identified um, is true of this landfill. It was used for 30,000 tonnes of experimental tipping. Um, scratch the surface, there's a lot of information there. People being poisoned and uh, nearly dying, whole streets being poisoned by the site, etc. I'm now going to move on to um, Shadia's point. And um, it's a very important one. We've met with the, with the government and it, it goes like this. Um, for everybody, what happened with Zane was a political decision. So you have to suspend logic in terms of any um, standardised system. Of course, we support the system and improvements in the system. But when um, Number 10 Downing Street and the Prime Minister um, are involved in identifying um, within minutes to hours how a child died after an emergency cobra, um, it's pretty clear that that was a political decision. And what is uh, known by the media is that the truth is halfway around the world before, sorry, a lie is halfway around the world before the truth has got its trousers on. 
Now, in this case, uh, coming from number 10, being absolutely plausible, the lie was several times around the world. And we were simply trying to um, survive because we were dying from hydrogen cyanide poisoning. And it would have been a, a very, it was a willful act on, on the part of the government. So we're not dealing with a standard situation. That brings me to when we met with the government, what the government were clear is if we had a judicial review, which is entirely possible, then that places it into a big case we know of in the UK like Hillsborough. So then you're looking at 28, 30 years uh, to get to the truth. So Hillsborough got the truth through an independent panel inquiry. So the guidance is if you want the truth in kind of, uh, um, you need to go for um, a, a quasi judicial process um, and the government can offer that but when we met with them, they knew, they absolutely knew that that was going to be problematic for them. And as they say, turkeys don't vote for Christmas. These are people stepped in Zane's blood so far that to return would be far more tedious than for them to tell the truth. So they continue to um, be very, very difficult but we are fortunate. Zane's case is in uh, political parties identified as one of the greatest social injustices of our time. And they will um, enable with that their, their level of consciousness, they will enable Zane to have that independent panel inquiry. So what I'm really saying to people listening is there is hope for Zane, but there wouldn't be if we went down the judicial review route, which would dismantle everything that's happened so far you know nobody here as experts would be able to really be involved because it would be going down this formal judicial route so we wouldn't want to do that it would just disband all of the support that's been built up so far but like I said the government know that they would never give us <laughs> um, a, a, the truth from a judicial review because the judicial review just re-examines what has already gone before. An independent panel inquiry requires full disclosure, lots of research, brings in uh, various experts, and that is how people like Hillsborough got to the, the, the truth. So we're very clear about the route that's needed. We don't want to be um, uh, diverted in the wrong direction. We're very clear about the route that's needed. Lots of experts are clear about that is the right route for uh, Zane's case. And I'd just like to highlight a point that was uh, made in the film Dark Waters. And I th the, the quote is, if the state won't protect the citizens from being poisoned, then we the citizens will stop them ourselves. And this is the thing about people coming together and hopefully getting to a tipping point. And this is the point of hope, because we do understand that when people come together, um, things can change. You know, this is the point of solidarity. So Zane is in a situation and the public are in a situation, but we've got to stick the course. We've got to uh, unfortunately try and be patient but we've got to stick the course of a route that will get us the truth because it was a political decision. Thank you very much and we do uh, I very much hope in a kind of uh, well I hope we will get to a stage where you know the the, the Earl Tennant stage where you will be fully vindicated you know and that that the story is already going out there, it's supported, as you said, by unions and political parties, etc. But we will get to that full inquiry, which will confirm exactly uh, what you've said. So I think this is what we're aiming towards, and the fight will still be ongoing. And I'm sure a lot of people who are listening here tonight um, will will join the fight. Um, there's uh, another question from Neil uh, that Neil Pitcairn to Liana. Thanks for such a great film, by the way. You mentioned at the beginning of the film how difficult it was 
to get these issues covered by mainstream media. Do you think it's any better these days or is it still uphill? Do alarming reports like that of male fertility declining by half in the last few decades help you to get media time or do they in fact turn the viewers, readers, listeners off? It's too depressing. Uh, also a very interesting question in terms of in how far, um, you know, bad news motivates people or demotivates people, I think. So, Liana? I mean, investigative journalism is seen as too time consuming and too expensive by uh, most media outlets there, are, you know, so it's, it's, there's not, um, there's not, there's not enough of it at all. Um, so I only made it, uh, you know, two years ago. So no, I don't think it's getting any easier. Um, and I do find the, um, you know, the increase in um, male infertility extremely interested and I would um I did an interview with Erin Brockovich a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about that and um that she had already met you know some firefighters this is about PFAS PFOA um PFOS um causing infertility so I wanted to see what Rob might have to say about that too is uh, she said she's seeing it already in some firefighters Yeah, uh, the, the, like the impact of PFAS on firefighters is something that's just now starting to get attention. Uh, you know, these are people that have been using these chemicals in firefighting foams for, for many decades without being told that these chemicals were even there. And now there's concern that these chemicals might have even been used in some of the coatings of their gear uh, that they've been wearing um, and that that may be coming off as well. So it's something that's just now starting to get attention and people are quite alarmed that these people that are supposed to be protecting us have, have been uh, not told this information and this information has been withheld from them and just now starting to understand possibly you know, they, not only could this stuff be in their water, in their food, but also in the materials that they're handling at work. Rob, I know you have to go rather soon. Have you got time for two more questions? Sure. Thank you very much. So uh, one question, um, a great deal of personal sacrifice over the years exposing DuPont. Did you ever nearly give up? is one of them. And then a question from Jane Hyde. Is it your view that there's a need for systemic changes to the system of US law, such as changing the burden of proof requirement on those affected by environmental damage caused by others? And if I actually may, because it fits in with the last question, asking what happened to the medical monitoring tort claim I'm not at the end of your book, but you said it was, you thought it was going to be short lived. And are there any moves around the whole of the US lobbying to make that a possibility again? Yeah, you know, I've, uh, this was a long process and it's a process that's continuing, you know, to get this story out and to deal with this public health threat. Um, and, you know, when it's, it, there, have, there have been tough times throughout the process, not, you know, for particularly not only the people that have been living through this in their communities, you know, that have watched family members get sick or die as we're waiting, you know, for this to, to be confirmed. Um, but, you know, I always thought back in the back of my head, you know, listening to Mr. Tennant say, the world needs to know this, this information needs to get out. And that's kept me going and continues to keep me going. And I think we are seeing um, some real uh, progress in developments. Uh, you know, the medical monitoring concept that you brought up that we used in the case in West Virginia, um, it, uh, we actually just had legislation at the federal level proposed a week or so ago here in the US to try to create that concept on a nationwide level to allow people specifically to these chemicals, these PFAS chemicals, because they get in our blood and they stay there, man-made by, com by these companies, to impose responsibility on those companies that did this, to have to pay for the medical testing, and importantly, to, to hopefully also have to pay for whatever studies need to be done. There are a lot of folks that say, we know more than enough now. 
to know that we need to take steps to stop these exposures. So if there are folks that say, oh, we, we need more, we need more information, we need to wait, then the companies ought to be paying to do those studies, not the exposed people. So I'm, I'm really encouraged to see that because what that shows is once again, as Kai was saying, you know, people can make the difference here. And you know, it, it may be difficult. It may take a long time. It may seem like insurmountable odds, particularly with certain adversaries on the other side, but it can happen and it can be done. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged to see that um, at least with the PFAS chemicals, we're seeing some progress finally. I think you're all uh, incredible fighters and you're all leading, uh, you know, you're leading the way all of you individually as, as absolute role models. As you say, it's a, it's a fight that's made up of all, all those different aspects, all the, all the individuals like you, you know, and the law and the media, civil society, etc. cetera. Um, and to get away from, um, as, as, as someone was quoted, the nurse at Standing Rock in Liano's film, you know, we let corporations become our government. And I think we have to take that back on a national level, on a local level, um, and make sure that, that laws are enforced, that people are protected and have their human rights protected, rather than the regulatory bodies lagging behind and vowing, you know, just not acting fast enough uh, because uh, they're linked with corporations. Um, or you know they're not resourced sufficiently, or for whatever reasons they're not not doing their, their job properly. So, um, it, it, does anyone have a, a last word or last uh, comment to make? Uh, you've all been absolutely extraordinary, and I know we've gone slightly over the time, but then again, uh, we've had very good attendance. I thought, and you've all been absolutely inspiring issues. How we can take matters further. Um, to have your local and uh, national fights rather uh, reflected also on an international level. And I'm always happy to help on that too, to bring information to the, um, you know, to the mandates, to the to different UN mandates. Uh, if I can be of any help, please um, also be in touch with me. I'd love to play uh, a smaller part as I possibly can on this to, uh, to help you carry some of the burdens, if I may. So, and I wanted to thank you for absolutely spreading the word at the Big Green Festival. And I know. If there's anything you, you, you'd like to say, otherwise I will bring the panel uh, to an end. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here and I really, Appreciate the opportunity to be on this. It was an honor to be on the panel with you, all of you folks. So thank you. Thank you very much. I just totally second that. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, the <laughs> and please just everyone stay in touch through social media and can carry on the conversation. Thank you very much.